Welcome to my arting desk. What's going on here? Well, these paints are from a viewer sent package I received a while back. You can see the unboxing by clicking on the little info card in the corner. In a previous video, I had swatched the Primatech dot samples that came in the box. Now, in this session, I tackle the rest of the contents. I've edited the footage down to about 28 minutes. I think it works. I mean, there's pouring, stirring, sketching, inking, first paint layer, second paint layer, then the final close-up and thumbnail shot. So there's a lot to pack in. People have asked what that metal stick is, the thing I use to stir the paint. This is a dab tool, but I've also used a cuticle pusher from a nail grooming kit. I think more often people just use a toothpick, but I need to keep those for toothpicking. I find that the older I get, the more challenging it is to keep my chompers free of hangers on. Not only that, there are times when the mouth mechanics just seem out of whack. You know, with those bits of food getting lodged in the back, going down the wrong pipe, or getting really adventurous and exploring a nasal passage. Or maybe you don't know, and it's just me who's forgotten how to eat. The worst is when we've had the full boat at Ivers. Sure, it's delicious, and enough to fill two people with battered fish, fries, slaw, and chowder. But the entire trip home is spent pulling this or that from my teeth. And producer Mike is a captive audience as I announce each discovery like an archaeologist digging up artifacts. Hmm, clam or cod? Nope, definitely cabbage. And that's my bit of oversharing for today. I'm not going to go over each color here because the swatching portion is coming up and I'll provide color names and pigment numbers at that time. But oh, I'm always happy to get new paints and just look at these beauties. The pencil sketching here is at triple speed, as is the inking after. So hang in there, the watercolor action is coming soon. In my head, I was thinking of those 
outfit of the day and what to pack for a week in Europe, things you see on Pinterest. Thank goodness I used a waterproof pen this time. In a previous project, I used one that I hadn't vetted properly. Eventually, I would like to try more pens in various styles. Markers, dip pens, glass pens, cartridge pens, etc. That covers a lot of ground, though, and it's kind of intimidating. But I'm intrigued. And that is partly due to watching the Peter Draws channel. Interestingly, my sister talks about the Peter Draws channel, but she doesn't talk about my channel. What's up with that? Here's the Faber-Castell Pit Artist Pen, or as I call it, Old Reliable. It has a brush tip, so there's a little bit of flex. That is one of those purchases that I'm really pleased with. It's part of a set that also came with a soft brush tip, a calligraphy tip, and a bullet tip. And I often find myself reaching for either the brush or soft brush tips. There's nothing wrong with the others. Uh, I just really like the brush and soft brush tips. The paper is Arches Cold Pressed, which is 100% cotton. I'm glad I chose this paper. The paints ended up looking really good on it. This piece is basically a collection of color swatches, so there was no mixing involved, which would have made for a more interesting painting, but the purpose here was to show off each color in its pure form through washes and glazes. Here's Rose of Ultramarine from Daniel Smith. It's a combination of two pigments. PB29, Ultramarine Blue, and PV19, Quinacridone Violet. Oh, Mayan Dark Blue from Daniel Smith is PB82. I haven't encountered that particular pigment elsewhere, but I'm sort of infatuated with it. Later, during the second layer, I spent a little too much time playing around. But can you blame me? Just look at it.
Viridian from M. Graham is PG-18. I really need to find a more up-to-date color resource, but Handprint.com has a lot to say concerning the value of this pigment, more than I can easily relate second-hand print, especially when they use words like flocculating. One of the two Van Gogh colors included here, turquoise blue, is an eye-catcher. It's made with PB15, phthalo blue, and PG7, phthalo green blue shade. That's a lot of phthalo going on, and I expect it'll perform great in mixes. Coors Sap Green is one of my favorite versions of that color. It's a mixture of PG36, phthalo green yellow shade, PR101, red iron oxide, and PY150, nickel azo yellow. Check out the video where I swatched Core's Earth Colors 10 of 6 5ml tubes. Links will be attached. Ionian C is from handmade watercolor maker Soliloquy. It's very shimmery and makes me think of The Little Mermaid. Yes, the happily ever after Disney one at first. But then I start thinking of sea foam, which in turn makes me think of the tragic Hans Christian Andersen version. Yeah, it's a roller coaster ride of emotions that wears me out. You might be thinking, just because they're fairy tales doesn't mean they're intended for kids. In which case, you might be surprised to find out. The Little Mermaid was first published in a book titled Fairy Tales Told for Children. Oops, I've gotten off track. Daniel Smith's Cascade Green, PBR7 and PB15. This is one of several items here that remind me of my fourth grade teacher, Miss Beer. She was young and pretty, and the coolest teacher in school. With her flared skirt, leather boots, and VW bug, there was quite a lot of hero worship going on that year. This was 1978. I am sure they don't do this anymore, but at the end of the school year, the entire class got to spend a day at Miss Beer's house on the waterfront. We collected shells on the beach, ate lunch, and a few of the girls even snuck up to her attic bedroom, jumped on her brass-framed bed, and oohed and awed over the lace-covered vanity table. Don't judge. Of course, as with every good party, someone threw up on the living room carpet. No, it wasn't me. But, strangely, I don't remember anything after that. Potter's Pink, PR233. This is one of those shy colors that requires a bit of coaxing. With a little patience, you can get a nice, natural-looking rose pink. But it's probably not for those painters who have no use for subtle coloring. Personally, I'm fascinated by its granularity and imagine it being used with floral subjects. It's Lunar Earth. I don't know where I got the red from. Just ignore that. I understand this pigment, PBR11, known as Magnesium Ferrite, is not commonly used in watercolors. This one is from Daniel Smith, and I believe Roman Schmall offers it as well. If you can, check out Kimberly Crick's video where she features this pigment. Hers is one of the most informative channels for watercolors. I'll attach a link to it in the corner and in the description. And if you thought Potter's Pink was subtle, uh, tear vert. What can I say? We have a history. 
But not to worry. Daniel Smith's version does not contain the green earth pigment, PG-23. Instead, it's a hue, a mixture of PG-18, viridian, and PBR-7, iron oxide. It may not look it, but that is positively bold compared to the actual green earth pigment. Permanent blue-violet from Van Gogh is PV-19, quinacridone violet, and PB-29, ultramarine blue. If you haven't discovered the joy of drawing and painting slouchy socks, give it a try. I could do it all day. Only partly because, while growing up, I had to share my older brother's tube socks, and he was a track runner all sweat-stained and scratchy, you can imagine my misery. After that familial bonding, drawing soft and pretty footwear is necessary therapy, even now, many decades later. And Da Vinci's Naples Yellow, PY35, Cadmium Yellow, and PY43, Yellow Ochre, there's no horror story to go with this one. The next 10 minutes or so show the glazing process and how lovely these colors look when they're intensified through layering. So I'll take a cookie break here and then I'll be back to talk about, among other things, this tape I used.
the tape I've been using is from Dollar Tree. It's worked pretty well for me, but after having some issues with one particular brand of paper, I wanted to try alternatives. So this was my first time using blue painter's tape. I'd intended to get the delicate surface variety that was recommended to me, but producer Mike had this lying around, so I commandeered it. It's just the regular sort, and it worked fine for the most part. After some time, though, it began to pull away from the board. But when it came time to remove it from the paper, there was no tearing whatsoever so that's good. I don't want to give the wrong impression here. In no way, shape, or form am I a fashionista. My days of studying the latest issue of Vogue ended with the 80s. But let me tell you, I was way ahead of the padded shoulder craze. I'd incorporated them into plenty of my drawings before they started popping up in music videos and Who's the Boss? And before you tell me to stop living in the 80s, let me remind you of the cyclical nature of fashion. Sure, it may be unpopular now, but just wait. It'll be back because you can't keep a poofy shoulder down. I'm happy to share this experience. It was sort of a walk down memory lane, I guess. But don't worry. I'm not sitting here crying into a margarita over childhood sock trauma. Because I'm all out of tequila. Until next time, stock up on toothpicks and stay artsy, my friends. <laughs>